Um, I'm a physicist from the University of Paderborn, and I wanted actually uh, to understand economics because uh, I'm lacking equations which I can hold on to and which I can really calculate things and not have just a model and see what happens. So I will talk about economics and if I understand it right, energy should turn out in the right way in some way too. Uh, and so we'll see what happens. I'll talk about a model, a future model, about differential forms and line integrals, about accounting, about laws of economics, production, and growth and a summary. <coughs> Sorry. I will start with a philosophical question. Why okay, sorry. Why do we teach our children and students the knowledge of our past, even though they need the tools of tomorrow? So we do this because many things of today will be valid in the future. These are the V elements. And but of course, many things of the future are today still unknown. These are the U elements. Okay, so the, um, and we can try to find examples for this future model. Well, science is typical. In science, all elements may be divided into two categories. They are always valid now and in the future. Those are the teaching facts. And then presently unknown, in the future known, these are the research results. But let's go more specific into different, different sciences. Let's go to economics. In economics, all elements may be divided into two categories. Ex ante, always known, like functions, for example. And U are the ex post terms, only known in the future, like income. We can file our income tax return only at the end of the year, not now. In physics, systems may be divided into two categories, conservative, always known, like the motion in conservative forces. Kepler's law of 1619 are still valid today, as space has no friction. And we have non-conservative uh, motion, which is only known in the future, like turbulent motion in the weather. We have also mathematical examples of the future model. A uh, two-dimensional calculus may be divided into two categories. We have exact differential forms with a known stem function, and we have not exact differential forms which do not have a stem function. Or we can use integrals. In calculus, uh, integrals may be divided into two categories. Riemann integrals with path independent and known, calculable, and we have Stokes integrals which are path dependent and the path is unknown. In statistics, all elements may be divided into two categories. They are known constraints with precise value or they are unknown, they are probable. And precise value is only known in the future. And our data are real numbers. And real numbers may be divided into two categories, rational numbers they are solutions of linear equations, and the solution is always no known. And we have irrational numbers. They are solution of nonlinear equations, and they are very difficult to solve. Okay, now we can get more specific into economics, and I will look at possible mathematical tools for economics. We can use in we can use differential forms in macroeconomics. Uh, all the V are uh, all ex ante terms must be written as exact differentials, and all ex post terms must be written as not exact differentials because they are unknown and the other ones are known. Or we may write all ex ante terms written as Riemann integrals because they are known, and all ex post terms must be written as Stokes integrals which are not known. Or we can use statistical theory in microeconomics. All ex ante terms must be written as constraints, uh, fu as functions, and all ex post terms must be written as probability terms. Or we can use chaos theory and differential equations, and all ex ante terms must be written as linear differential equations, and all ex post terms must be written as nonlinear equations which are not solvable. 
Um, I will only talk about the first two parts, differential forms and linear integrals. Uh, it is obvious that statistical theory of microeconomics is done with statistics. And I think about chaos theory, we'll hear somebody else at the end of this uh, meeting. Um, let me shortly talk about differential forms and line degrees in case you have forgotten. In two-dimensional calculus, we have exact differentials f, df, f is a stem function, and uh, df uh, is formed by df dx df y dy, and the mixed differential are equal. You can look this up here and calculate that if you want to. Uh, and not exact differential forms, delta m, have no stems function. They can be constructed, for example, by multiplying with a, an exact differential with x, and then we will find the mixed differentials are not equal. Uh, we can do this, we can multiply x times df. This is, uh, df is up here, and df is, x times df is 4, x to the fourth, because one uh, multiply with x, so this, this is here, and uh, here we have x to the fifth, and if we now make the mixed differentials, we have here dif differentiating by y, this would be 7 times 4 is 28, and differentiating by x, and this is 35. 28 is not equal to 25, as a 35, so this is not exact. And these are very difficult differential forms, they are very difficult to handle. But there's hope, there is an integrating factor. Uh, we may reverse this equation and write <coughs> df equals 1 over x dm. This means a not exact differential form may be transformed into an exact differential form by an integrating factor of 1 over x. So far about calculus of differential forms. I'll come back to this later. Let's look at integrals. We a closed Riemann line integral of an exact differential is always zero. The integral from A to B along yeah, is equal to the path from B to A, and the closed integral is zero. That is like the end, like going on a ring, you end where you started. Examples are mechanical energy in a conservative force, for example. Uh, and we have the U-terms, the unknown, a closed Stokes line integral of not exact differential form is never zero. The integral from A to B is not equal to the integral from B to A. The closed integral of the M is equals capital to delta M, and that is uh, not zero. Examples are magnetic fields or vortex fields, high or low in, in the weather. And uh, these are actually spirals. Each term brings it up by delta m by one. So closed integrals, uh, Stokes integrals are spirals like magnetic fields, for example, or vortex fields, all the weather. Okay, now we have the line integrals. And now I come to accounting. Um, I will first present the neoclassical flow model and gives this example. A household works in industry earning 100 euro per day, spending 90 for food and goods, and the surplus is 10 euro per day. This is a very simple balance, and the uh, neoclassical flow model tells us income flows from industry to households and consumption costs flow back to industry. The surplus goes to the bank and back to industry for investment. So this is what I learned from many models, but this model unfortunately is wrong. Imagine industry pays a hundred euro to the households and receives only 90 back from consumption costs. And the next day industry must borrow 10 euro from the bank to pay again a hundred euro. That cannot be true. Industry will not go along with this. The neoclassical flow model is invalid. Unfortunately, yeah. The, this account is actually a Stokes integral. Integral pays the income of 100 and households pay, oh come on, consumption costs and industry and they are not equal. This is 100, this is 90. So this is a Stokes integral. 
And the balance is indeed not a ring. It is not that we have the zero balance, like the Italians say, the zero contour. This is not a, so it's not a ring. It's a spiral. The spiral goes up at 10 euro every, every day. And if they mismanage, it goes down into deficit. So uh, uh, an uh, unbalanced account is always an example for a Stokes line integral. It's a spiral, not a ring. So we can write this balance as dm equals ch minus uh, yh income minus costs. And that is delta m, that is the surplus. So this is a new view on, uh, on accounting. Now we want to do real accounting and we go back now into economics to Luca Pacioli, who in, 19 for, in 1494 wrote a book uh, on mathematics including double entry accounting. And uh, looking at the same example again, he says, um, there is of course a monetary account with income and costs, but there's always a second account that matches this account. And these both add to zero. There is a productive account because if the, the family earns a hundred per day, they invest a hundred euro in labor, in work. And if they spend 90 euros, they obtain 90 euros worth in goods. So these two accounts, the monetary account and the productive account, always must add to zero. And that's what they do. And the monetary account measures the productive account in euro. If we look at this productive account on labor or work and goods like food, they are originally measured in energy units. Labor is measured in megajoule and food in kilocalories. Everybody knows that. It stands on the, f on the foods. But uh, but Jody says in double entry accounting, the monetary account measures the productive account in euro. Okay, and since these accounts now I have shown are Stokes integrals, we can write this equation down. The monetary account plus the productive account add to zero. This is Pacioli in uh, Stokes integrals. And now I come to the laws of economics. The laws of economics are based on Pacioli, which is valid now for five, more than 500 years. He, the monetary account measures the productive account in euro. And from this integral, we may derive the differential equation delta M equals dk minus delta L. How is that possible? Well, if we integrate, make the circular integral, then we have this over here, and integral minus dl, this is over here. And here we have the closed integral dk. This is the closed Riemann integral, and that is zero. So what we obtain from this integral is we, uh, uh, we obtain a differential equations, which tells us that output depends on capital and labor input. And, of course, we have known that for many years. But this is the first time that we write this down as a differential equation. And these equations follow the future model. All not exact differential forms are written here as Stokes integrals. And here the same. All not exact differential forms, uh, uh, all ex post terms are written as not exact differential forms and ex ante terms are written as um, uh, as uh, exact differential forms. And now we have a second law here. We have the law delta m equals lambda df. This means the surplus, the output, is closely connected to a production function df. Uh, and this is the existence proof of the production function, because a not exact differential form may always be written as an exact differential form times an integrating factor. So uh, this means there is a production function which always exists to any uh, economic action where you have an output. The second law replaces the neoclassical solo equation y equals a times f of k and n Instead, we have, well, delta m, let me say, this is 
income minus costs, so if you look at income here, this would say delta y equals lambda df. And you see uh, Solo's equation is y equals a times f of k and n. Um, this can only, if this, if lambda is constant, you can integrate that and then of course lambda is equal to a, and then this is true. But if lambda is not constant, the Solo equation is not correct. And lambda will turn out to be the standard of living, and the Solo model is actually uh, made for economic growth of change of standard of living, so lambda will change. So this Solo equation c cannot be applied then or at least only in restrictions. So this is the correct law that we have to use instead of the solo model. Um, before I go on, I will look again at the Pacioli law. Pacioli said the monetary account is measured, measures the productive account in monetary units. And since the productive account originally was measured in energy units, we could turn this around and say the productive account measures the monetary account in energy units. And we could turn uh, money into energy, for example, by the oil price. And if we do this, we can write the same laws okay, in monetary units, or we can S write the same laws in energy units. I just changed the letters here to indicate that these are energy units. And if we look at these laws now here, we find these are the law, first and second law of thermodynamics. What we find is a structural identity of economics and thermodynamics. We find surplus is heat, Capital is energy, wealth is enthalpy, production is, lay, is work, mean capital means means energy, a production function means entropy, the number is a number, the price per item is, corresponds to pressure, the volume or amounts to volume, the Lagrange function of economics corresponds to the free energy of, phys of thermodynamics and the Le Chatelier function to the free entropy. So there's a one-to-one -one structural identity between economics and, uh, and thermodynamics. And we can look at, uh, at the GDP per capita for 125 biggest countries in the world and compare that to the energy consumption per capita and we find there is a strict linearity between these two functions. So energy and capital are strictly corresponding here. Let me shortly uh, say something about the production function entropy. Entropy replaces the Cobb-Douglas function of production. The Shannon entropy is ln x to the x, y to the y, instead of x to alpha, y to beta. The, um, uh, the, f the factors, the elasticities of alpha and beta are not any more valid. It's now the function itself that leads to the elasticity. We do not need in, uh, in with the entropy, we do not need elasticity here. And uh, so the Shannon ex uh, entropy x ln x plus y ln y replaces this function. And you see this function looks very similar, but it's much bigger because the maximal production function uh, People thought the Cobb Douglas function is the biggest one. It's not. The Shannon entropy is the biggest production function. It's much bigger than the Shannon than the Cobb Douglas function. And entropy has a very important uh, property. Entropy is a part of the production function of macroeconomics. Probability is the main part in microeconomics. And entropy with being S L equal L and P is a link between macro and microeconomics. And you can go to microeconomics, but then you have to remember that S is the, the, the macro uh, uh, f uh, function S uh, is also uh, valid in, in microeconomics, and there it is called L and P. Uh, let me sh shortly show how entropy, what entropy has to do with work. Um, first I will talk about entropy and disorder. 
uh, a light breeze E, this is the first law here of some uh, light breeze in the park will easily uh, empty a paper basket and generate this order, that is entropy. The paper will never come back into the basket. But a janitor may come and work and sweep the paper together and put it back into the basket. Work reduces entropy, work is ordering. And this is the function of the production function. In a big company or car company, there are lots of bolts and nuts and wheels and all things. And what do, do the workers do? They order these parts and reduce the entropy to make this car. And brain work people, they puzzle about this Gurnard word. Well, it turns out to be ordering. And a, a doctor orders the body of his patient and the teacher orders the brain of his students. And in the addition, this, this term here shows that production costs depend on lambda, on the standard of living. Not only on the production function, but also on the, on the lambda. And this means most people produce in China because there the standard of living is much lower. So this is very sensible. Now I will go into production and growth. I will use the closed integral of dq equals tds. In motors, this is the Carnot process. And uh, in, uh, in economics, this is called the production process. In the Carnot motors, in the motor, we suck in cold air and the exhaust is then uh, eliminated again. And here is the same thing. We collect cheap or buy cheap, sell expensive buy cheap, sell expensive. That is the same cycle as in the motorcycle with cold and hot. And let me show you this now on my example here. Um, I will show this in an example of a trade between uh, coal manufacturing in South Africa. Coal is distributed all over South Africa and people now collect the coal, that's a this, is, this is a TS diagram, this is the entropy. Uh, the coal is now brought to, uh, to Cape Town all over the country and now it is collected and now we have in Cape Town a big pile of cheap coal. And this is the first part and then uh, this is exported to Antwerp to Europe and there we have a big pile of expensive coal because coal is much more expensive in Europe than it is in South Africa. And then th the importer sells it to the customers and before we finish this production cycle I will look at the monetary cycle. The importer collects the money from his customers and then he pays the exporter in South Africa but of course he pays not everything, he keeps them for himself. And the exporter pays his worker and also keeps some for himself. And then the foreman can buy a car in Europe and now the cycles are closed, the monetary cycle and the productive cycle are closed. And what happens now in this diagram, this is now the TS diagram, and the, the, the surplus that has produced, the profit, that is now divided to both sides. So both sides profit from this and they start now over with the same process. But you see they spiral up, they get richer, the, uh, the earnings get higher and higher. So the production process is a Carnot process. And uh, we can calculate economic growth by seeing how the, pro the profit is uh, distributed piece percentage uh, distribute to the lower side, to the poor side, and 1 minus p to the higher side. Okay, And there we get exponential growth if p is smaller than 0.5. We get linear growth for p equal 0.5 and we get stagnation if the lower part gets too much money. This agrees very oh no, and we can calculate, we can now compare this to trade. This is China-US trade and we see this fits, the data fit very well to the uh, calculations. And we see China triples their GDP in 20 years. US only has a 1.5 factor, but the actual values show that the 
The gap between rich and poor has grown from 24 to 41 thousand uh, dollar per uh, per capita. So th the machine of a motor, a motor gets always hotter and hotter and hotter. And the economic system gets always, uh, the gap gets bigger and bigger and bigger. This is the result from this uh, Kano process. And this is the same result that has been found by Piketty for the last 2,000 years. That he says the lower side grows by 3% and the rich side by 4 to 6%. So the gap grows all the time. Let me now finish and ask how does energy come into this? And um, we do this uh, in thermodynamics by using the enthalpy E equals P plus P times V, this is the enthalpy. Here we would have the wealth equals capital plus price times volume. And this, this is the price of energy times the volume of energy. And then the Q is the H minus VDP. This would then be the same corresponding term. The entropy stays the same. And in thermodynamics, we have to maximize the free Gibbs entropy. And uh, this would be the same. We would have to maximize the Chatel Le Chatelier functions, W minus lambda F, that will lead to maximum. So this is the way I can uh, propose that energy is inserted into uh, economics. Because here in this model I have not used f physics. I have just used the laws of Pacioli. And this turn out to be very similar to thermodynamics. So I will not go into, I could repeat this again. Maybe I can just say, uh, we cannot find uh, y equals f of k, e and l. This is impossible. We have Wealth is capital times price times volume of energy. That is the way how we combine energy and money. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for this very thoughtful uh, talk. And uh, I'm sure there are some questions. Yes. Uh, yes. Can you speak uh, loud? Thanks, uh, uh, thanks for your talk. I have one question concerning the neoclassical circular flow model because you claim that it's inconsistent. Uh, yes, it's a circle. It should be it it should be a it must be not a circle but it must be a spiral. Because you nevertheless you argue that it's inconsistent although it's taught by ten thousands of professors to Unfortunately every yeah. year yes. at the core of each economic textbook. Yes. Uh, the lack of mass. You see, in physics, we have we start with uh, mathematics of uh, of uh, gradient, uh, rotation, and divergence. Nobody knows that in economics. The gradient brings us the gradient of wealth brings us the the, f the, the refugees from Africa here. This is a very p important political f function, uh, and the gr the rotation, the curl is actually every bank account is a curl and uh, it is like in the weather and if you have a too strong deficit you will have a very strong low or in weather what you would call you would call a thunderstorm or even a cyclone and if the greek parliament or if the greek account gets too low you have a real uh, cyclone in the euro area because this really disturbs everything in the european uh, monetary system so it is very important to know about these functions curl and gradient and divergence and nobody knows this in economics because they think they don't need it because they don't work in space but actually these functions are of in physics they are vital because you cannot do any theory in physics without these three terms gradient uh, curl and divergence and this is part of this what I'm talking about here It's the ideal. It's the ideal. Yes, it's the ideal. Yes, sure, sure, sure. Because if you want to maximize the efficiency, you get no power because it takes an infinite amount of time to exchange. 
Yes, I know, I know. Uh, Carno took. I just argue that is the same ideal process because Carnot, uh, you see, this is the, the, the Stokes integral, you have no path. And Carnot defines this path as ideal path. But in reality, this is, not, this is not valid. And the same is, of course, in economics. You have to look at the real path and see this is very close to this ideal path. But this is not only the ideal Carnot process, right? Yeah, your argument is right. Right, yeah. But the, the whole, the biggest thing about economics is to explain the relations that you can observe on accounts and find the causalities, the behavior of people. An example, accounting tells you that saving equals investment. That's accounting. Yes. Yeah. No, I say nothing. I just take the equations and take the solutions. And this is what I'm looking for in contrast to the models that are used. And you never know whether this is right or that is right. Sometimes they take the Keynes model and some others say, no, I don't like it. I take another one. Would you ever in thermodynamics or in electricity say, I don't like the, this equation. I'll take another model. And you, uh, even the iPhone is depending on the laws of the of, of the electric law of of, of uh, Maxwell, and you need these laws, and you can do lots of things based on this truth. There are no laws. It's a social science. The laws this is not true. Yes. Yes. No, I have no no I did not say this. This is not true. Even the neoclassical models, if you have a bank and interest, it can be stock for consistent. And so the the difference between theories is how you explain the behavior of the computer. So just I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, at the ma yeah, at the at the structure, you have the you have thousands of parts. In a in a way, you can say it that way, but you order, and every housewife knows that ordering is work, and uh, this is what happens here. Uh, so. But you misunderstand me. I argue that economists do not use math enough. I don't say that they don't do things right. But there are many things that are not right. Uh, like, for example, the solo model is not really 
everything because the second law is much or has much more power than a model of of solo for example this the second uh, law is valid not only in physics it is valid worldwide and so this is a thing you can trust on but i don't say that the results you have caught by found by thinking are all wrong but i want to check this by equations and i would see which one does right or which is not right and uh, so we can follow up with these laws all your economic steps and say okay this is right and this is not right but uh, but I need a, I, I just want to create a basis from which you can check what you are doing, and you can expl extend this also to politics and also to social sciences, because that is the many particle systems which also are part of the uh, uh, thermodynamics. But I don't want to go that far. Um, y yes, I mean, you, the problem is you are starting a question for a specific problem. Um, with the laws of thermodynamics, I, c I can solve any problem in heat, every anything. And I always go back to these equations. Uh, I can explain the furnace or I can explain the uh, metals and how the alloys work. Uh, there are very many different questions you can answer by that. Just going back to these equations. And I'm very sure that you can go back to this problem too. I would have to think about it a little bit. I mean, I don't have all solutions at present at the moment. But this is a tool in that it works in science. Einstein says this is the most effective theory of all in physics. And uh, I agree with that. And I think it is not applying only to physics. It also applies to many other fields. <laughs>